Hi, I'm Graham Steele, CEO and founder of CryptoSense. Welcome to session two of our crypto risk training course. We're in the middle of going through a bunch of examples of crypto risks and real case studies of when they happened. Uh, so don't hesitate to have a look through session one if you weren't there to catch up on the context. Uh, otherwise, let's get straight back into it uh, with our next example. So let's look at encryption and signature modes. So in order to apply an algorithm for encryption or for digital signature to data, we need to combine the algorithm with what's called a mode that tells us how we're going to pad out the data if it doesn't fit exactly the block size of our algorithm or how we're gonna split a big long string of data that we want to encrypt into blocks into the right way so that each block is the right size for the algorithm and so on. So we need to have this stuff specified uh, in a unambiguous way to make sure that systems interoperate and when we decrypt, we get back the same data and so on. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of different ways of doing this. And it turns out that if we use the wrong mode for what we're trying to do, that can result in a security issue, even if the algorithm we chose to do the encryption or the signature is itself uh, perfectly secure. So an example of this is the method of using the RSA algorithm for signature that's defined in PKCS number one V1.5. So first of all, PKCS, what does that mean? That means public key cryptography standard. Uh, and these were put together by the RSA company. So the company that commercialized the RSA algorithm and the patents associated with it. Uh, and that ensured that everybody could implement RSA algorithms and they would interoperate uh, and so on. And so standard number one, PKCS hash one, is the one that just defines RSA, how RSA happens, how do you make an RSA key, how do you do signature and encryption. There's a whole bunch of PKCS, some of which we're going to talk about a bit later in the training course. So version 1.5 of this standard gave a method for uh, padding and uh, using in encryption, uh, sorry, using uh, the RSA algorithm to do signature. Uh, and this method of doing so, uh, we, we sort of knew in the, the late uh, 1990s that it was difficult to make proofs of security for this uh, mode of signature. Uh, and in 2003, there was an update to the RSA PKCS1 standard, so version two, that standardized a new additional method for signature uh, called RSA PSS. Uh, but the uptake of this was slow, partially because it requires uh, some random number generation to happen uh, in the signature. Uh, but still, people weren't quite sure whether RSA PKCS1 v1.5 was actually secure or, or not. Uh, and then at the crypto conference that I, I mentioned in part one, the, the big cryptographic conference that happens every year in Santa Barbara, there is a rump session, uh, which is a very famous uh, event every year in, in the cryptographic world. And at the rump session uh, in 2006, a guy called uh, Daniel Bleichenbacher, who now works uh, head of cryptography at Google, revealed an attack on RSA PKCS1, where essentially with a bit of kind of blackboard uh, mathematics, you can forge uh, a signature. So at the time, it wasn't clear what the consequences of this was because it relied on a couple of specific things. First of all, you had to be using an RSA key that has a public exponent of three, uh, which isn't as crazy as it sounds because that's actually quite a smart exponent to use if you're concerned about uh, efficiency of certain operations. Uh, and you have to have a particular kind of bug in the way that your ASN1 passing works for the structures that you get in this signature. And so some people were sort of thought, well, you know, that's, that sounds pretty like a corner case. I don't think we're going to have any trouble with that. But it turned out that that bug and uh, was present in a whole bunch of very widely used libraries like OpenSSL, Java crypto libraries, NSS, GNU TLS, and so on. Uh, and actually, there were a lot of RSA keys around, particularly back in 2006, that had uh, three as their public exponent. Uh, and this error keeps coming back. So in, in January 2016, uh, Filippo Valsorda, who now um, manages the Go crypto library, uh, showed that you could still uh, make this attack on the Python crypto library that has 100,000 daily downloads back in that time. So this bug uh, keeps coming back. So generally speaking, RSA PKCS1 v1.5 is being phased out. It's being phased out of the new version of TLS, uh, for example, to make sure we can't accidentally uh, roll back onto this onto this issue. But there are lo loads of other problems with cryptographic mode. So ECB mode, for example, PKCS1 v1.5 encryption mode uh, also has issues we'll talk about later in this series, or CBC uh, encryption mode without authentication. And we're going to come around to a few more examples of that when we really deep dive on encryption uh, later on in this course. 
Okay, nonce management. So what's a nonce? A nonce is a value that is only used once. Usually it's not necessary that the nonce is unpredictable, although nonce specifications and properties might vary on particular uses in cryptography. But there's loads of areas of cryptography where having a, a, a single value that's only used once is really useful for constructing systems. However, when that's the case, the fact that this value is only really used once is completely vital. So a lot of operations which are perfectly secure when this once only property is, main, is respected uh, actually fail catastrophically if you use the same uh, value twice. So a good example of this from the real world concerns the Sony PlayStation 3. So this was a DRM mechanism. So the idea of this was that uh, Sony didn't want that people could write their own games or their own software for the PlayStation without paying the license fee to Sony to do so. And so the idea was that the PlayStation 3 would do a cryptographic check, a verification on the, the CD as it was at the time that you, you put in the, on the ISO image and check that it had been signed by Sony, which implied that you'd pay the, your license fee to them and otherwise it wouldn't uh, run the code. And so there's quite a lot of uh, kind of hacker community around uh, hand rolled games, uh, homebrew games for, for PlayStation. So these guys were quite motivated to try to figure out a way to, to break this DRM. Uh, and the DRM seemed to be well thought out. It was using a widely used uh, elliptic curve based mechanism for digital signatures called ECDSA. Uh, however, ECDSA has a very particular property. So every signature that you make with ECDSA has to have a, a sort of a nonce value in it. Uh, a value that's only used uh, once. Um, and this, if you actually go ahead and use the same value twice in ECDSA, this for two different signatures on two different um, ISO images, for example, uh, with the same key, this allows somebody to, in a pretty simple bit of mathematics, uh, do some math that allows them to get the value of the private key. So not just to forge a single signature, but to actually pull out that private key and then make as many signatures as they want. Uh, and so you can just publish this key and now everyone can uh, sign whatever they want and put it in a PlayStation 3 and run it and the DRM is uh, completely broken. Uh, and, and in fact, in ECDSA, you have to be even more careful with these values, but we'll talk about that a little bit later in, in the training course. Uh, and you find this problem elsewhere as well. There's been recent work about nonce reuse in, in TLS servers. So really in the wild, you see this problem going on all the time. Um, it's a real uh, Achilles heel of a lot of systems. Okay, so mostly when we use cryptography, we don't go down to the low level and carry out uh, individual operations of signature and encryption. Normally what we're doing is implementing a protocol, particularly when we're doing encryption for uh, data in motion. And so there's a bunch of standardized protocols out there for this kind of stuff like SSH, TLS, IPsec, but all of these protocols have a bunch of configuration options. So you have to decide how to set up your protocol. And there's a problem which is that most of these methods are not actually secure if you get the wrong configuration. So if I put the wrong configuration into my TLS, then actually my TLS will be breakable. Uh, and this is complicated because the baseline that I need to get to is always changing. People keep publishing new ways to break TLS, for example. That means I have to tighten up my configurations in certain ways. Uh, and I have to keep an eye on this stuff, really keep up to date with it, and then enforce this policy that I come up with everywhere in potentially hundreds of thousands of nodes in my large network. Uh, make sure there isn't anywhere that I'm, I'm misconfigured my protocol. Uh, it's a real challenge for, for modern cryptographic uh, management. So here's an example of a protocol uh, configuration attack. Uh, this one is called Drown. It's a very nice attack that was announced in March 2016. And at the time it was announced, it affected 33% of HTTPS websites. So these are websites that use the TLS protocol um, to serve their HTTP. And the way this attack worked was it was an attack on a particular way of doing TLS, a very old way of doing it, which is uh, SSL version 2. In fact, this was the first publicly available version of what's now known as the TLS uh, protocol. So SSL version 2 was known to have weakness in it, but uh, since there were new versions, so SSL v3 and then TLS version 1.0, 1.1 and 1.2, lots of servers left SSL version 2 on just in case somebody had to connect with a very ancient browser that hadn't been updated. Um, and they knew that most modern browsers would refuse to use such a, a, an old version of the protocol. And so they figured this was a secure kind of backup. Uh, if somebody needed to use it, they could, but it wasn't going to affect the security of, of other exchanges. And the really nice thing about the drown attack was that they showed how you could use an attack on SSL version 2 to break a connection that somebody else was making with a perfectly secure 
TLS version 1.2. So at the time, that was the most up-to-date version of TLS. So you can use the old crypto to break the new crypto. Uh, so it's a very nice attack. It actually relies on, amongst other things, the uh, attack on PKCS1 version 1.5 encryption that I mentioned a couple of uh, slides ago. Uh, so you can find this in all kinds of places. So on SSL in old embedded devices where SSL v2 was left on, legacy Java applications that have old uh, TLS uses. It's interesting to see how leaving that old crypto is actually worse than, than turning it off. It, it actually can be used to break the new crypto, uh, which is an example of quite how difficult it is to get protocol configuration right. It's also an example of the interaction between crypto operations. So we can often have a case in cryptography where operation A is secure, and let's say it's an encryption operation, operation B is secure, and there's some signature operation. But if I do operation A followed by operation B with the same key, that actually breaks security uh, completely. And this kind of interaction is really found uh, in the wild. So let's talk a bit about the RBS WorldPay heist. So this happened in November uh, 2008, and the team behind it managed to get away with about $10 million out of the ATM or cash machine uh, network. Essentially what happened was that hackers were able to access a RBS uh, WorldPay data center in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, thanks to a misconfigured uh, Wi-Fi access point. And once they got in there, they were they were in. They was like, okay, we're in the network now. How do we get the the money out? They realized they were able to talk to the APIs of the hardware security modules that are used to verify pin codes in in this network. And they contacted a specialist attacker through a chat room, a hacker chat room, and uh, that person was able to show them how to exploit the API of the of the hardware security module and the cryptographic API it had to access. Pins. So the point of these APIs, they're supposed to be set up so that whatever happens, there's no way that you can call the API in a way that will reveal a customer pin code. Uh, it just tells you whether the, an encrypted pin that's arrived on the network is correct or not. But if you leave too many commands turned on in that API, there are clever ways that attackers can combine those commands to essentially construct a code book. So that is a list of encrypted values and what is the pin that must be inside them. And then they just have to sit there and wait till a transaction comes in with an account number, see an encrypted pin that they know, and then they know what the pin is inside. And that's indeed what they did to create pairs of account numbers and pin codes. Uh, they also jacked up the limits using um, direct calls to the, the SQL database to increase the limits of those particular accounts that they'd managed to crack. Uh, and from there, they were able to make this $10 million uh, cash out. Um, but this happens also in uh, combinations of other cryptographic operations like just encryption and, and certain kinds of Mac or signature and encryption uh, decryption modes. Uh, so these interactions are a real uh, danger point inside cryptographic design. Finally, a weak algorithm. So when you think about uh, attacks on cryptography, you might have thought of weaknesses in the cryptographic algorithms as really the first category, so the sort of most common issue. But in reality, even though there are weaknesses in algorithms and the state of the art is always changing, Attacking the algorithm is, is very rarely the easiest thing for an attacker to do. Those things we've just talked about, so getting nonces wrong, random number generation wrong, exploiting weak modes and so on, are much more common in real practical attacks. But occasionally, breaking a weak algorithm is really what happens to, to exploit uh, an attack. And it can be difficult because often we don't realize that we're still using weak algorithms uh, inside certain libraries or frameworks or sets of certificates um, that, that might be a weak point that a, a sophisticated attacker could exploit. So to give an idea of how this uh, happens in practice, so in May 2012, it came to light a uh, use of a malware called Flame. So what happened here was the Stuxnet attack on uh, the Iranian nuclear program, where the malware essentially got inside the centrifuge control systems and the nuclear centrifuge control and made them spin around really, really fast so that they, they damaged themselves. And here is, in this photo here, you can see some uh, nuclear centrifuges. Uh, this is from a totally different incident where these were seized from a, from a shipment on a boat. Um, but this is the things that were made to spin around so fast that they, that they broke themselves. So in order to effect that uh, Stuxnet attack, there was already some uh, reconnaissance uh, malware that was used uh, to figure out how that uh, network worked so that they could customize the, the Stuxnet uh, code to make sure that it worked. And that was the uh, the reconnaissance malware was called Flame. It was deployed in lots of other places. We don't even really know where or when it was deployed for the very first time. But what we do know is that to get itself installed, to bypass a uh, check that uh, the code, any code that's run should have a correct signature on it from, from Microsoft for a Windows update, 
they used a fake certificate that exploited a weakness in the MD5 hash function. Uh, and the method that they used to create a uh, collision that they used to make this exploit was different from the method of MD5 collisions, which by then, in, by May 2012, uh, was publicly known. So that indicates that the party that was behind this attack was able to break MD5 long before it was public that this hash function was indeed uh, breakable. We'll talk about the breaks on MD5 a little bit later in the hash function section uh, and, and how we know that this was a, a different method. So sophisticated state level attackers definitely do have exploits on uh, weak cryptographic algorithms and they may have breaks for things which we know to be weak for which real proof of concepts and breaks are not yet in the public domain. Uh, and we also see this, for example, with SHA-1 certificates. So we now know that SHA-1 has collisions, um, but we don't have any sort of serious um, uh, exploits out there in the wild. But it doesn't mean that there aren't state level agencies that are able to exploit those weaknesses. So to give an idea of the scale of this, so back when we were doing this uh, training course as, uh, as enterprise services, uh, we did a count of all the cryptographic misuse vulnerabilities that had been added uh, to the MITRE CV database over the last two years. Uh, and there were 1,806 of them. Uh, so that compared, I think, with about 500 SQL injection bugs. So it's actually a major category of, uh, of vulnerabilities in, in popular products, so the things which are counted by CVE database. Uh, a study in uh, 2014 by some uh, researchers at MIT showed that uh, of CVEs around cryptography, 83% of the bugs are in the applications, not in the cryptographic library code. So, so these vulnerabilities are not just people using uh, OpenSSL in a weak version. They are using a secure library, but causing calling it in an insecure way in the kind of errors that we've been looking through uh, in these last two sessions. Uh, and we should know that static analysis tools are not very good at finding crypto flaws. Uh, so NIST doesn't make the results of the state evaluation public anymore, but the last edition that was public showed that less than 2% of errors in the security feature category, which contains all the cryptographic examples, could be state-by-stack -stack analysis. And the reason for that is if you think about the kind of things we've just looked at, so random number generation, key management, uh, using a nonce uh, incorrectly, so using a number again, it's actually really tough to spot those kind of things just from static analysis of a code, even with a very sophisticated static analyzer. What we can do with static analysis is spot weak algorithms, but as I mentioned, that's actually very rarely the way that attackers get into systems by bypassing the cryptography. So in the rest of this training series, we're going to go into detail on the attacks in encryption, in signature, in hashing, in password-based cryptography, in key management, and in protocols. Uh, so we're really going to deep dive on exactly how they work and how we can detect them uh, and avoid them. So uh, I hope you'll join me for those. Uh, go ahead and subscribe to the channel to make sure you don't miss when they become available. And I'll see you again here soon. Mm -hmm.